Jeannie Ives, welcome back to the Illinois Channel. So good to talk with you on what is a very snowy day here in Springfield. And we can see behind you a pretty beautiful setting and the snow obviously hasn't arrived. This is also uh, an historic day. Uh, as we tape this, the U.S. Senate is having their floor debate on whether or not to remove President Trump. And as we are taping this, there is not a vote as yet, we should note for our viewers. Uh, it's expected the president will not be removed. Although somewhat surprisingly, maybe to some, maybe not to others, uh, Republican Senator Mitt Romney uh, this afternoon announced he would vote to remove the president. Uh, and let's just start there. We want to talk about other things, but do you have any thoughts in particular on what's happening relative to this impeachment vote? Well, the fact that Mitt Romney is going to uh, vote to remove the president uh, from office is just, it's, it's out, uh, astounding. I, 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 I am sure that uh, he will not get reelected in Utah. And in fact, I think it's very inc incredible that one of their legislators put up legislation to basically put in the removal process to be able to take him out of office now. And I, I think that could very well go through. I think Republicans are united behind the president that in his State of the Union address yes, last night, he made it abundantly clear that he is for the people, uh, regardless of his rhetoric, regardless of his Twitter feed, regardless of what he may have been in the past or what you assumed him. When you look at the policies that he's put in place, they've been very, very good for America. And there's no, uh, there, there's no discounting his effectiveness as a leader of the free world. And so Mitt Romney is completely out of line here. He's out of touch with Republicans and I'm, I'm just shocked that he's doing this. As we, uh, as we tape this, you mentioned the, the night before, last night was the State of the Union address. Um, you want to become a part of the House, and so if, if you are elected, you will be sitting in that Congress to, uh, next time that they meet. Uh, any thoughts that on the State of the Union? I presume you watched it last night? Uh, I did. In fact, uh, our, our campaign hosted a watch party at our headquarters. It was well attended and people were in a very upbeat mood. They were glad to see uh, the president took the high road on nearly everything, uh, did not talk about impeachment, did not talk about the total disaster of the Iowa caucus, uh, where they couldn't even count votes in a single night uh, amongst only a few thousand people. It was incredible. So he didn't go there. Uh, he took the high road, unlike Nancy Pelosi, who ripped up the speech. And you know, just a little data point here. I mean, when we when I was a legislator, we always received a copy of the speeches for the state of the state and the budget address. I mean, I never saw a single legislator on either side of the aisle rip up a speech afterwards. Um, and and that includes, you know, when I was in the super minority under Governor Quinn, and there was a lot of policies I didn't agree with him there. Then that was when I was challenging uh, Bruce Rauner for governor uh, during the primary, and he gave his address. I never ripped up the the, the speech then. I mean. You, I just thought the Democrats looked really uh, tasteless and uh, they showed a lack of decorum that is shocking, not to mention they showed this whole visual group think where we're only going to stand when we're allowed to stand, except there were a couple outliers. And then the whole women in white stuff, it's just really, that's so grade school. Get over yourself, will you? And, um, and move on and can't you clap for the lowest black unemployment? You seriously can't clap for that. It's just it's appalling uh, th their attitude towards uh, uh, the president who has been very, very successful on the economic front. Let's take the conversation now back to Illinois and there's been a, a number of things in the news. We have uh, an investigation going on in the state house and there's been a number of uh, things happening. Uh, we had uh, Senator Sandoval first uh, indicted and then he pled guilty to uh, uh, some of the charges there. So apparently he is working with federal investigators. No one really knows at this point just how far it's going to go. Uh, in, in fact, there's just so many rumors swirling, as you can imagine, as a former state representative in the Capitol. It's often kind of like a high school where rumors go around. Uh, given, given the, uh, let's just say on ethics in Illinois government, I was curious if you had any reaction because you're probably like everyone else reading what's happening and I guess wondering what's going on. Well, I mean, there's no wonder about what's going on here. 
you can write as, as tough as ethic laws as you want to, but uh, it always depends on people reporting things correctly, on, on people doing the right thing. And so the bottom line is, is if you don't elect ethical people, you're always gonna have an ethical lapse. You cannot write the rules tight enough. You can hope that you write them tight enough so that if they are caught, they actually are punished for that. And, and that's been the problem in the past where people have just gotten a pass. And, and I mean, some of this stuff is just outrageous. Like the fact that all these guys were making legislation at the same time lobbying uh, governments whose legislation would be impacted. I mean, whoever in their right mind thought that, that, thought that was an okay thing to do. I frankly didn't even know that you could do that. And I am shocked at the number of colleagues, including people on the Republican side, who have their own side gig, even though they're doing, they're making legislative decisions on, on industries that they're lobbying for or working for or any of that. I mean, it's just, it's just outrageous. It, it's so corrupt down there. It all falls at the hands of Mike Madigan. He's run, he's run that place into the ground financially. I mean, the latest thing too with Representative Jack Franks, which he's, you know, he comes off as like this reasonable sort of guy who's always opposed to taxes. But the truth is, I mean, my first interaction with Jack Franks as a brand new legislator was a little bit disappointing. And this is the conversation that people need to understand actually happens in the House floor. I had a bill, my very one of my very first bills that I was running, it was in Jack's committee that he was the chairman of. And so you have to technically ask permission to have your bill heard. So I went over to Jack, I said, hey, can, can you, uh, you know, have kind of a hearing on my bill? And he says to me, well, I was told to kill your bill, but because I like you, I'll at least give you a hearing. <sighs> okay, really? That's how we get legislation through. That's how we decide what bills should be heard or not heard in committee. But this is their attitude. They know that they have the upper hand. They know that they can control every piece of legislation that goes through. They know they can answer to nobody but Mike Madigan. And even the quote unquote best, uh, you know, more reasonable Democrats, at least on taxes, are just as bad as the rest of them. But Mike Madigan's got a long list a long list of people that are in trouble in terms of sexual harassment, bullying, intimidation, um, sexual assault now. I mean, a long list. Mike Madigan needs to go. His entire leadership team needs to be upended. But the bottom line is, is they're, they're going to attempt to write even stricter ethics laws, which, by the way, they refuse to write the uh, pass my ethics legislation that I had uh, then I started in 2017 and 18. They refused to pass it, and then they they passed a more minor version of it uh, after I left office. This is who these people are. Um, if they're going to write the legislation, then the Democrats think that they get to control what it looks like, and they want the credit for cleaning up their own crap. It's 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 despicable. They all need to go, and and voters should pay attention to what's happening. We will move on to federal issues at one point, but just before we do, uh, okay. I mean, you and I had always talked when you were a state representative and you always had uh, uh, insights that we thought were interesting. So I'm, I'm kind of missing your voice down here in Springfield on these issues. And that's oh. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. But the governor just gave his state of the state address and he talked about ethics uh, and he he also said that, you know, mention was kind of condemning a number of the things you were just condemning. I didn't know if you had had any thoughts as yet. I mean, obviously, it's, he's had one year in. Um, I don't really know what uh, Pritzker's uh, approach will be. Do you, do you have any insights or thoughts as far as how Pritzker is handling uh, this issue in general? He's handling it terribly. This is a billionaire who took the toilets out of his second mansion to, to, get, to scam on his property taxes that he knew his, his fellow taxpayers would have to pick up the differential of $330,000 that was levied on other people. I mean, he's under federal investigation himself. And you can't apologize enough for it, uh, Governor Pritzker. You just did the wrong thing. You thought you could get away with it, so you did it. Do you know how many, there's really, really good ethical just regular people in the state of Illinois that would never attempt to do that. They would never do that because they knew it was wrong to begin with. You gain the system to your own benefit and now you think you're going to clean up the mess. I don't, I don't trust these people. I don't believe them. Um, and the, one of the most unethical things he's done, quite frankly, is, uh, is pass an unbalanced budget, uh, pass tax hike after fee increase, after another tax hike, 20 of them, I think, uh, last counting, 
on, on the backs of taxpayers that can't afford it. In my opinion, that's immoral. That is an immoral thing to do in the state of Illinois when you didn't cut spending at all. Not one ounce was spent. Not one ounce. You have preschools, four-year-old preschools in the state of Illinois where the state taxpayers are spending $17,000 per kid to educate four-year-old preschool 170 days a, a, a year for you know six hours a day. It's outrageous. Outrageous amount of money to spend. Uh, you know, it just starts with there. There's been no... I, 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 I'm sorry, I get really upset about this topic, especially from grandstanders like him who have no idea what they're talking about. You know, the other uh, issue that uh, kind of is a good bridge between both state and federal is this whole issue of who gets to vote. And it just recently also came out that the Secretary of State, because we have same day voting registration when you sign up for a license, that the Secretary of State had signed up uh, initially, it was 400 and some uh, people to vote who weren't uh, uh, eligible to vote. Uh, as we take this, uh, there is a hearing today in the uh, Illinois House on this committee hearing. Uh, the Illinois Channel will be airing uh, portions of that uh, later. But um, if you had any thoughts on that and just uh, should, the Republicans, I know, are saying we should uh, suspend the same day registration but this was a concern when that was first proposed so how are you going to be able to adequately go through and make sure that you're not signing up people who are ineligible to vote sure i mean and we brought this up in the governor's race with the idea that the city of chicago has their city city id city key id system too which is just another um thing that they give to any anybody you don't have to be a citizen you just have to live in the city of Chicago, get your own ID, and it can be used for multiple purposes. Now, it is it is almost too easy to uh, register to vote online. Um, I actually, I'm not 100% opposed to, I'm opposed to automatic voter registration, but I thought it was interesting when this legislation was first uh, put up and it was simply, you know, if you're getting a driver's license, then we're going to automatically register you to vote unless you actually decline or say that you're not a citizen. So it was automatic. That is a problem. And first of all, because we're having illegals get a, a government document that can be used for a lot of different purposes. I oppose that. I think that's wrong. However, if the system were to work correctly, the best way to do it would be to say that if you are getting registered to vote at another government agency for, that you're interacting with as a matter of process, then the nice thing about that is that that registration was to go to the Secretary of State's office and actually be vetted and verified and have a super check on it to make sure that you are a citizen by checking out other databases. And then you have an extra qualification. Because even now, if you're just a registrar and any committeeman, any elected committeeman can actually just become a registrar, you can just go ahead and you can sign up people to register to vote at your kitchen table at your church, wherever you want to, you can do a voter drive. And it's dependent on that registrar to actually be doing the correct checks on whether or not that person that they are signing up to vote is credentialed enough to vote, to actually be a citizen. And so you've got a lapse there. I actually don't think it's a bad thing if the Secretary of State were to check out the whole system and do that. But obviously, Jesse White can't get it together and neither can his the people who work for him. It is. It is unbelievable in this age of technology that they are allowing this, this, this just, oh, it was just a random error. No, it wasn't. It was intentional. It was an intentional mishap. And, uh, and somebody needs to be fired over this, by the way. Somebody should be fired. Because listen, I, Tom, Tom Morrison, his state rep race was won by only, I think, 43 votes. 43 votes. This could have huge impacts on the balance of power in Springfield and they should shut it all down and start again. I, I remember, I think it was 1974, I'm geeky enough to remember these things. The, uh, there was a fellow, I believe it was in New Hampshire, who was elected to the United States Senate and his uh, victory margin was 10 votes. Uh, so, and we saw by 500 votes, George Bush became president of the United States. Uh, so, it may not sound like a lot, but it can be massively uh, important. Um, Bill Brady won the nomination for the Republican governor's uh, race in 2010 by 
197 votes, I think, against Kirk Dillard. So That's right. I remember that now. It, it's always very close, or, or can be very close, we should say. Let's move on to more. Just to focus, we appreciate okay. your thoughts on the State House and these issues. But uh, as you go around and you're running for the 6th Congressional District, which had been traditionally Republican, it went to Sean Caston, who is now the congressman. Um, he was the first person and uh, first Democrat in quite a number of years to have that seat. Mm -hmm. When you're going yeah. around and talking, I would imagine, and I want to know what are the issues that are resonating. I would imagine the, Donald Trump himself is an issue, that the health care I know you told us in an earlier conversation is an issue. Uh, the president had announced uh, earlier that by executive order he's going to require, I believe in January it starts, uh, that he's going to require hospitals to have thick, uh, prices that are published so we can have transparency in health care. Let's just start with that, and not, not that you have to talk just about that one aspect, but on health care. Mm -hmm. Let's start with that idea. Do you like the idea of having transparency on the prices, and are there other changes that you would like to see? Look, uh, a free market economy depends on people understanding the, the cost of things so they can make a, make comparisons. Uh, however, when you have private health insurance, which about 180 million people do, you are less likely to look at cost because you have a sunk cost anyway. You're paying your premium regardless, so you're not necessarily shopping around for the cheapest uh, surgery for a broken leg, so to speak. One, it's typically you know, going to happen within a very short period of time that you need that care. Two, you want the best that you can. So you're just going to go with whoever your doctor recommends or your friend or, or whatever. So you're less likely to, to shop on price when you already have insurance company as a backup. Um, so I think the pricing transparency uh, is good for, I think over time it can bring things down definitely for prices. I think the more that you can shop around, the more people will start to question it from a business perspective if they're because businesses are the one paying the cost for a lot of that stuff especially if they're self-insured so they're going to start to shop around and i think that's where you get the, the biggest uh, bang for your buck on that uh certainly if things are of elective certainly if you uh have not met your deductible yet and you need to you need to do a mammogram or you need to do a, an x-ray for for a, maybe a, a, a separate visit for a chiropractor or something like that you're going to be able to shop around and in fact your your other ancillary uh, providers of healthcare may tell you, well, look, I know that they only charge this at this place, and that that's actually what happened with my son. He needed an X-ray. They said go to the my chiropractor said go to this place. They're cheaper. So price transparency is great. It's not gonna it's not to be all the uh, at all. Uh, what we need is really uh, very good flexible insurance plans that are competitive across the nation. Because you, look, my son last year broke his leg. It would be a $56,000 procedure. I had an excellent surgeon. Uh, the top medical care, I, you know, he's 100% recovered. It's, it's going well for him. But I wasn't shopping around for a $56,000 leg surgery because I don't know anything about this. Um, but certainly my insurance company cares about that. And nobody can actually, very few people can afford to actually pay that out of pocket and, and deal with it. So the, the idea here is that insurance protects you from uh, a, a number of things in your life, whether it's uh, property theft, uh, your house burning down, a car accident, whatever. The same thing, we have to have a robust insurance product that is also based on price transparency and flexibility. And I think that's where we need to go. And I think that's where the president is. You know, this idea that the, like the Democrats want you to be all into one government health insurance program? Hell no, uh, no way, we're not gonna do that. Uh, they can't deliver in the VA. They can't, the Medicare uh, never pays for itself. Um, Medicaid is a disaster. It's ration care. You can't get the care. Doctors don't want it. They can't, the reimbursement rates aren't sufficient. We're not going to go that way. So thankfully, President Trump made that abundance. And I applaud him for that point. What about uh, another thing the president has brought up? Uh, and, you know, it's interesting to note, uh, he often brings up issues that are not traditional Republican issues. Sometimes they're issues mm -hmm. that had been previously championed by uh, some Democrats. Uh, the president is questioning the pricing on uh, prescription drugs. Now, other, one of the things the president has addressed, other countries, Canada, France, Germany, England, have uh, more socialized medicine than the United States and put a cap on drugs. And so the result is... Mm -hmm the cost of research, it cost about a billion dollars to bring one drug to market. Uh, 
Right. Uh, it's often the case that uh, apparently the the um, United States consumers are the ones that have to pick up the. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that. Sorry, I'm looking at some notes. Okay. No, I'm looking at some notes on this because this is a this is a really important topic to me because I just talked with a healthcare expert and we're formulating our plan right now. I wanted to get some of my facts straight, but the the, the truth is is that um, the way that the the Democrats want to do it and the way that they passed it with HR three, it essentially has the government setting the prices for all your prescription drugs. So you do not want to go down this road, and you don't want to actually have the international uh, the average international. Uh, countries also set the prices either because it destroys our our market for that getting new drugs to the to the marketplace it's extremely expensive there's better ways to do it and some of the stuff like president uh, illuminated last night are one uh, shorten the period between uh, approval by the FDA and the, the the time the frame that you can get it on this get generics quicker to the to the uh, um, to the market as well so th there's things that can be done in, in that realm um, let let's be honest there's there are drug companies out there where you can right now put your prescription in and they're going to and you can buy it in Canada and it gets shipped to your house and that is happening across the United States people are using that all the time there are insurance companies that will get you your drugs and they'll buy it in Canada and it's the same thing uh, it, it, it there is not a health risk there so I, I think the pharmaceuticals are going to have to be partners and figuring this out along with uh, consumers, uh, but we do not want to destroy the innovative drug market that we have in the United States. So we have to be very, very careful here. Uh, a lot of people's uh, well-being depends on some of these, these latest and newest drugs. Um, and we'll, we'll figure it out together, but it's got to be a free market solution. One of the uh, last things, and we'll, we'll let you go here very quickly, but we just want to talk, the president also noted the success uh, that he has had in doing new trade deals. He did the USMCA with Canada and Mexico. He has the first round with China. He's the first president to hold China accountable for not uh, stealing our intellectual property rights and, and other changes. Uh, do you hear much from any of the potential voters in your district of, of, about that? Or are they giving you any feedback? And just what are your own thoughts on this approach of uh, trade trade uh, agreements that uh, the president has done or other changes that you would like to see? Well, I certainly hear from business folks who do trade with China and, um, you know, they're, they're happy that they're getting a deal done, let's be honest with you. And, and the USMCA, we know from the Technology and Manufacturing Association that this was a big lift for them. Uh, trade with China and, uh, I'm sorry, with Mexico and Canada accounts for about 391,000 Illinois jobs are dependent in some form on trade with China and Me or Canada and Mexico. So uh, that's all good. He's uh, the farmers obviously are ecstatic to have uh, China buying uh, more product from us. Uh, that's good. Um, I, I I think it's great. I think uh, businesses though need to be concerned, especially you know you've got this entire coronavirus issue going on. You've got uh, human rights violations going in on by the communist Chinese government. Uh, you've got religious liberty being stripped away from people in China, which is a communist country. You've got Hong Kong begging and, and you know demonstrating for freedom, wrapping themselves in the American flag. And so we still need to be the beacon of freedom to people from around the world, which is, uh, and we need to make China kind of come to the table on some of that as well. They need to, they, you know, we don't like to deal. I don't think we should deal with people that don't treat their people, uh, you know, correctly. You've got to work with them over time, of course, to get that done. But uh, look, um, you know, our business folks, they, buyer beware to some degree, work, uh, working with China. Uh, and I don't want um, our government I want to uphold the rule of law uh, on all aspects of that. So I'm glad that Trump took a, pos a a strong stand against China, but I'm also glad that we're moving along the path towards getting some agreement as long as we maintain our principled stand on other issues like human rights and religious free freedom. Uh, you know, we live in the world we live in, not the world we want to live in. And people often mm -hmm. say, why are you doing business with this country or that country? Uh, hopefully, by doing business with them, we have some leverage to improve the civil rights records 
uh, but China has, uh, you know, as many as two million people reportedly in uh, in prison uh, and uh, are doing some things. I mean, even reporting where they're uh, killing people for organ transplants. Uh, it's just uh, it's some of these things are horrific. Um, Jeannie Ives, we've hey, probably... One last point on that, sure. though. One last point on that. I mean, what's with this Harvard professor uh, doing, uh, you know, basically doing some intellectual property transfer with, with China, uh, you know, getting paid by them to do some research and stuff and then not reporting it properly? I mean, who are these, who are these elitists at Harvard getting away with that kind of stuff? And there was another professor, too. I forgot which school. I think maybe that was in Oklahoma. Uh, but, but like, who are those those folks? Uh, we got to we got to worry about that. Uh, I well, I, I believe there was a professor who just came out that he was actually spying for China and transferring. A, oh, yeah, that's a, right. There was another one transferring yeah. intellectual property from our research to them. Um, you know, it, it sounds I know to some people like we're being paranoid. It used to be the the line in back in the 1950s in McCarthy or that you know Republicans saw communists under every bed but the fact of the matter is that we already know that the China sends over any number of people and that they are spies uh, even if they don't want to be they're pressured by the government uh, often to to uh, engage in gathering intellectual property we have any number of uh, Chinese students um, at the U of I and other uh, universities and around the country. My, I'm not going to point fingers at any one person, that's not the point, but I would say that all of us have to be aware and not think that this doesn't happen. This is the modern world we live in and in fact there are going to be spies uh, probably from any number of countries, but certainly China, on our college campuses and they're trying to steal our intellectual property as they obviously have a record of doing over the last 40 years. Absolutely. And what do we have? 15% of the student population or something like that at U of I is Chinese. Uh, we, we took out a $1.2 million insurance policy over three years in case our Chinese student population dropped at U of I because they're so dependent on that foreign, uh, that money coming in to support the university. Uh, at, you know, at the same time, um, you know, you've got really good students that are not allowed admission to our University of Illinois. So I, I have a problem with that since it's a land grant university, and I think that needs to be relooked. Uh, any uh, university that has a Confucius uh, Institute as well, that's been apparently a a way to convey communist Chinese ideas into the community. Um, and so I, I think we have to be very careful here that China is only about China. They are a communist country again. I think people forget about that. Uh, and, you know, we, ha we have a right to be uh, a little bit concerned um, about their antics and what they're trying to do. Jeannie Ives, there's always more things I'd love to talk about because I love talking politics and you're always forthright and a fun person to interview. But uh, once again, I've kept you longer than I intended. We, uh, we will have the March primary coming up on March the 17th. Um, if all goes according to, uh, l well, let me ask you just how, how is the campaign going for you? I think you just reported some fundraising uh, numbers recently. Yes, so uh, we reported in the fourth quarter that we raised about $262,000, but the most important thing about that is that um, overall, since we got in this race, 89% of our donors are small dollar donors. We have over 3,500 individual donors that have donated to our campaign and 89% of them are small dollar donors. So we're really, really uh, thrilled with that because it just shows you that there's this grassroots momentum to uh, put somebody in there who cares about getting the right solutions together for everybody. And I, I'm very pleased by that. Well, well, we'll see what happens obviously in the March primary. I started to say that if yeah. all goes according to what appears to be the case, you will be the nominee, you will be running against Sean Caston, the current congressman. Um, and for those who say, why don't you interview him? Uh, we've tried and we will continue to try, but so far we haven't had any feedback from his campaign to allow us to set up an interview. It's not that we're trying to do just Janie Ives uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have him as well. 
Jeannie Ives, thank you for joining us today on what is, again, a snowy day, and I think it's coming your way, so we'll let you go in case you have to go somewhere. Uh, but as always, we right. appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.